So about 100 years ago, Detroit was the hub of innovation for all of America. And in fact, it was considered a shining light, an example of American entrepreneurship for the world. And it was the assembly line that really made this happen. The assembly line made it possible for every family in America to be able to afford a car. And it brought the cost down to a point where that was possible. And there were two other technology innovations that made the automobile possible. And that was the internal combustion engine and also standardized parts. These things came together. And over a very short period of time, as I think everybody knows, the car became very, very popular. It had perfect product market fit, and in fact grew according to a traditional S-shaped model. By 1926, four million cars were produced that year. Nearly 20 million cars were on the road, one for just about every five Americans. It was both very successful, and at the same time, the market was starting to saturate. This was the first time in the production of cars in 1926 where more used cars were sold than more new cars. So there was this enormous pressure to be able to continue the growth that had gotten to Detroit to where it was. So how did Detroit react to this? And the way that they reacted is they created and enacted planned obsolescence. And I'm going to read through this quickly. It's a policy of planning or designing a product with an artificially limited useful life so it'll become obsolete, that is, unfashionable or no longer functional after a certain period of time. Now, what I would note about this is this is the first time in history that people thought actively about the idea of planned obsolescence. And Alfred Sloan, who is the president of GM, was a leading thinker and an actor of putting planned obsolescence into action. So how did he do this? Well, they created something called the model year. And we take it for granted now, but the model year of a car was a brand new concept back in the 20s and 30s. And the idea was we'd have cosmetic changes that would entice people to upgrade year after year. You can see the fins and the taillights and all these things that actually weren't that useful. They turned this technology icon that didn't change every year into something that was more of an element of fashion. More nefariously, they started to do things like limit the useful life of the cars. They would put in parts that they knew would fail after two or three years and at 50,000 miles instead of 100,000 miles. And there were a whole series of things that they would do where in the supply chain for replacement parts when things break, they'd stop supplying replacement carts. And this was all enticed or all done in order to entice customers to buy new cars every year. And as a result, Detroit stopped serving customers. So what happened? We all know what happened. Cars like the Honda Civic that you see here came along and they served customers in terms of what customers wanted, high quality products that last a long time with the technology that consumers wanted, very specifically high fuel efficiency. And as we all know, here's what happened to Detroit. Detroit is now a shadow of its former self. It was once a leading hub of innovation and technology. It's no longer a center for innovation. And some people would say, a lot of people would say, that planned obsolescence killed Detroit. So let's fast forward to today. Here you have the iPhone. We're all very familiar with the iPhone. The leading light of technology innovation today is Silicon Valley. And the leading product from the largest company in the world by, in terms of market capitalization is replaced every single year. In fact, it's designed to be replaced every one to three years. It sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? So the question is, is anything different this time? And what I would say is, I would say this time things are very, very different. You have three major factors that have changed. One is you have Moore's Law that we're all very familiar with. And this means that the technologies that are within the phone, whether it's the bandwidth, whether it's memory, whether it's screen size, are changing very rapidly. Number two, you have cloud computing. And what that means is this device, this single device, can grow in capability year after year after year, not just because of what's in it, but all the services that you connect to. And then third, unlike Detroit in the 30s and 40s and 50s, 
there is an overnight threat of global competition. So this is an incredibly competitive category. And what I would say about this is instead of planned obsolescence being a problem, planning for obsolescence is actually the foundation for Silicon Valley today. We'll take a quick look at the engine that Apple uses. So looking at this slide, you'll see that you have this foundation of software. And the software is updated every year. And you have the phones updated every year. And you can see that it pulls people along. It pulls along people that buy the new phones. Every year, there's technology innovation in the phones. People want to buy the latest and the greatest. And there's good reason for doing that. And at the same time, the software stops supporting the older models of phone. What's good about this is that it's very predictable. So it means that if you're a software developer, you know that there's going to be this natural progression. But what about other products? The iPhone is a special case. It's a very large special case. But what about all the products that are around us, the connected devices around us in our homes? And what I would suggest is that you take a look at this framework here for thinking about how to develop connected hardware companies. On the left, you have the useful life of a product. And higher is a high pace of technology innovation where the expected life is just one to three years. Lower would be seven to 10 years. And then you have a high price point and a low price point. And when you look at this quadrant up on the upper right, this is the quadrant we just talked about with Apple. And the key elements for success in this quadrant are to have a product where you're delivering true innovation with the hardware. And when you bring it to market, it has to have the latest chipsets, the latest technologies, et cetera. And then you have to have a software ecosystem that makes it easy to go from one generation to the next. Now, a couple of things. One. There's only one Apple. And the reason why is because consumers only have so much room in their pocketbooks for expensive devices. And the second point that I'd make here is that I think there will be a one or two other companies that come into this category. And whether it's Oculus or not, I think that VR is a sufficiently different platform that will have these sorts of rapid iterations. So what about the other categories? The next category that I talk about is one where you have a relatively low price point, but you have a high pace of technology innovation. And that's where you have successful companies like Fitbit, you have Beats, and you have GoPro. These are all great examples. What's important here is that it's a very focused product. When you take a look at Fitbit, you know what Fitbit does, and the algorithms and the software and everything updates a lot. And at a lower price point, people are willing to replace it every couple years. And I would argue that in this category, it's actually not that important to have a strong software ecosystem. And it's not something that's really going to lock people in because it's easy to upgrade to another product because the products are relatively cheap. But you do have to drive down costs, and you do need to encourage multi-unit sales. So taking a look at the next category, which I think is a very interesting category, you can take a look at what I call the land and expand quadrant. And the land and expand quadrant is what a lot of people commonly refer to as Internet of Things in the home. Nest is an example. Sonos is an example. And the idea is you have something that has a relatively low pace of technology innovation after an initial step function. And you expect to have a thermostat, a loudspeaker, a smoke alarm in your home for seven to 10 years, a longer useful life. So what that means for a strategy for this type of company is get your initial foothold and then protect that beachhead build great software that makes that product better over time, and then use that to sell more adjacent products. So I think for anybody that's had a Sonos product, you know that if you put a speaker in, you use it for a little while, a year later, two years later, if you like it, you buy another one for another room. That's a way to encourage repeat purchases. And what you'll find with each of these categories is that selling hardware is OK. All of these categories, you'll find that they make most of their money in the initial hardware sales. And then they think about how do they sell more hardware over time. And in fact, if you take a look at these companies, you'll find that the bulk of their profitability and revenues indeed comes from hardware.
And the biggest risk here is if you don't develop the hardware for this category with a 10-year lifespan in mind, you're not able to upgrade the software, you're not able to lock people in and get them excited about buying other products in that category. And then the final quadrant is what I refer to as the Detroit quadrant. And this is where you have long-lived long -lived products with a high price point. That's where you have cars, you have TVs, you have kitchen appliances, you have DSLR cameras. And in this category, this is the most challenging category because you want customers to come back, but they only come back every seven to 10 years. So when you build a product and you want to have word of mouth where those customers refer your product to other people, it has to be high quality. It has to be something that lasts for a long time. And some of the product uh, approaches that work is to actually approach it with licensing or develop it with a long period of time. And, but it, in general, that's a category that's a very challenging one as a startup or as a large company to maintain large margins over time. So a couple of other observations. The quadrants can shift. And the risk that Apple has with what they're doing right now is that they can move down into the Detroit quadrant. And what that means is a product that people are happy and excited to replace every one to two years, they don't need to replace it for every five, seven, 10 years. And this is what's happened to PCs and laptops and to a lesser extent, tablets. Another way to look at this is you can be in the point product category and then your product moves over into the Apple quadrant. And that's almost like the Death Star coming in and taking over your product category. And this is what happened to the point and shoot camera category. And it's part of the reason there's a lot of value with Apple and the constant innovations is because they're integrating from subsequent areas. But overall, it's possible to win in every quadrant. You can see the companies that have done well in each of these areas. And there are a few things they have in common. One, as I mentioned before, it's okay to build a business where you're focused on selling hardware and you use the software as a way to build a relationship with a customer, either build increased product sales through adjacent products like you have down in the land and expand quadrant with Internet of Things in the home, or you have regular annual updates. So. Some final thoughts here. One is planned obsolescence was something that killed Detroit eventually. Uh, at the same time, today you have real technology innovation going on in Silicon Valley and understanding those lifespans is at the core of obsolescence strategies and the foundation of Silicon Valley today. And I wanted to share a final thought here. This looks like a play on words, but it's actually a very, very important distinction. One is about screwing your customers. And that's the trap that Detroit fell into, which was planned obsolescence, forcing people into the next generation of product without real technology innovation. I'd argue that planning for obsolescence is about serving your customers. And it's about providing products with the right lifespan, could be one to three years, could be seven to 10 years, could be longer, that meets their needs because you have the pace of innovation, you have to provide those new products that they want. And to build a successful connected hardware company today, don't force obsolescence, but recognize obsolescence and harness the rapid pace of technology innovation to the customer's benefit. Thank you. Thanks.